Tech. Uh, thank you uh, for your time and coming today. And um, I have um, a few questions, actually. Um, one is, I think, I, I don't know if you've touched the topic, but um, the one is the concept of equality of opportunity. I think evenness of opportunity. You know, every had, everyone has the right to, to, you know, to actually develop themselves. But some people, like, you know, Africa people, they don't have maybe the capital yeah. or whatever to actually develop or flourish themselves. So how does, uh, I think this is kind of part of the safety network yeah. too, but um, how does uh, Ayn Rain uh, think and how do you think about uh, this topic? And let, me, let, me, let me take the questions one at a time because yeah. I can't remember. Yeah, okay. yeah. I'm getting old. Um, <laughs> it's true. I, I think equality of opportunity is a, is a real misconception. There's no such thing. We can't equate opportunities. Right? Some of us have go to good schools and have well-connected parents, and, you know, and others don't. And, and the only way to try to make it a little bit more equal is by denying some people opportunity for the sake of other people. And then again, you're back to coercion. So what I'm for is a different type of equality. I think the only type of equality that means anything, that is real. Anytime you think we want equality of X, and you know that equality of X is impossible, metaphysically impossible, because we're all different, something's wrong with the statement equality of X. What equality is possible? The equality that the Founding Fathers talk about in the, in the, in the Declaration of Independence, the, you know, where all men are created equal, that equality means equality of freedom, equality of rights, equality before the law, but where the law is a law that protects rights. We're all, we're all born free. We're all born with the right to pursue our lives free of coercion. No matter what color skin we have, no matter what ethnic background we have, no matter what you know, man, woman, we're all born free. That's the only equality that exists. Now, that, a political system that respects that, that preserves that equality of freedom, that equality of rights, is also, I believe, a political system that maximizes opportunities. Rather than equate opportunities, maximizes opportunities for everybody. So if you're a poor kid born in a free society, you have more opportunities than a poor kid born in a socialist equal opportunity society, a society trying to equate opportunities. So I want a political system that maximizes opportunity, doesn't equate it. So when I think of Africa, I want to maximize opportunities for people in Africa. How do you do that? By making them free. How do you provide capital to Africans? There's a wonderful book by Hernando de Soto. Hernando de Soto, a great Peruvian economist, an economist from Peru, called Capital Ideas. And this is what he says, he says the problem in Latin America and the problem in Africa of poverty partially is because people lack capital. But they don't really lack capital. What they lack is legal recognition of the capital that they have. So they don't have title over their home. They don't have title over the land that they have. But that is just government creating laws that protect rights. Government doing away with a feudal system that still exists in part of Latin America and part of Africa. But if we recognize a farmer's right to the land that he's farmed for generations, suddenly they have capital. And when they have capital, they have opportunities. So the way to solve the problem is to establish the rule of law. And what I mean by the rule of law is a rule of law that protects individual rights. 
all the other problems go away. Thank you. So I think this is, I have another question, sorry. Is it okay? Go ahead. Is, is about like, when you talk about, you know, I, I'm free to do whatever I do, what I, what I, what I want, and uh, then, for example, there are some common social kind of problems, like, for example, unemployment and education, and, and this, uh, it's a, will, I think, will, cre like, economically create some, increase the crime rates, for example. So if, if socially you want to decrease the crime rates because you want your, child to be safe. I think like just thinking alone on yourself and if you want to pay or no, whatever, it's a safe network, it's, it's, it's linked, it's kind of linked, but it's, uh, I just wanted to know about how Ayn Rand think about this need and how people should take about, like take care. And, and the last question is, how did she think or you think about Japan, how they, this kind of social economy actually <laughs> growth such, as, as the level that is right now, and it was, it's not capitalism, it was like socialism as, as, uh, from, from my view sure. or anything. So, it's a mixed so. economy. It's a mixed economy like every was. Okay, let, so let's, so, um, oh, see, you asked two questions. I can't remember the first one. <laughs> one word about the first one, what was it? Social yeah, social problems. Uh, you mentioned education and employment. Crime. Crime. So, the government's job in my view, its only job is to protect me from criminals. So the government should do its job. There's also no evidence in the literature uh, of a correlation uh, between crime rates and, um, and unemployment, for example. So <clears throat> we live today, certainly in Japan, but I would say really globally, we live today in the safest, least crime-ridden period in human history. There have never been fewer homicides, murders. There have never been fewer rapes. There have never been fewer uh, deaths by war than in all of human history. This is the safest time ever. And it, 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 nobody knows, it, you know, there's no, it's not clear why. I mean, I have a theory, but it's not clear why. It's certainly not related to unemployment or employment. Um, so, Ayn Rand would say there are no such things as social problems. Right? Um, individuals are unemployed, and they're much more likely to be unemployed the bigger the state is. It's fascinating, but capitalism, when industry is left alone, it always, everywhere it's tried, creates more jobs than there are people. Think United States during the 19th century, in order to keep the economy going, they had to import millions and millions and millions of people in order to keep it going. Indeed, even the United States today, in spite of all the mixed economy, we still need millions of immigrants. I mean, partially because some Americans won't do certain jobs. They'd rather collect their welfare checks than actually go to work. But, you know, Silicon Valley, we talked about Silicon Valley during the talk, I lived there in the 1990s and, and dabbled very badly in some venture capital and stuff like that. Half the startups in Silicon Valley are started by immigrants. Indians, Chinese, Israelis, Swedes, half. So, you know, it's self-generating. Capitalism generates more jobs than there are people, and, and there's actually an economic reason for that. People are scarce and therefore you innovate in order to reduce your dependency on people. Um, so all these problems are really eliminated by freedom. And those that are not, like crime, that's the job of the government. The one job of the government, the only job of the government, is to rid ourselves of that, is to, is to police, is to create that. So there is this notion that I hear sometimes from people is, we should vote for statism um, because if we don't, the poor will rise up and there'll be a revolution against the rich. And, and I hear a lot of that. Rich people always say this to me. Oh, I, 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 I want a big safety net because otherwise if we just leave poor people alone, there'll be a revolution. But if you look at human history, 
It's never happened in a free country. True, in, in, in France in the 18th century, but that's because there was a king. And what did, what did uh, uh, Marie Antoinette say? You know, uh, let them eat cake. You know, she was so detached from, from, from the reality, right? Well, because we all shock you. But, but in a free economy where people rise up and they go down, and there's never been a revolution of the peasants, right? There was a revolution in Russia because there was a czar, but not because there was freedom. Okay, so that's, that's the first question. The second question, very quickly, about Japan. I mean, the fact is that countries do well economically to the extent that you allow them to be free. Post-World War II, you had a constitution that allowed for quite a bit of individual freedom. The Japanese constitution is the only constitution in the entire world that has the statement that individuals have a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which MacArthur put into that, which doesn't even exist in the American Constitution, but exists in your Constitution. So you have a strong element of freedom and, a, and of individual rights, even if it's not completely absorbed by the culture. It's there in the legal code to some extent, so that you've had a lot of freedom, and therefore you've done well economically. To the extent that you reduce that freedom, you stagnate. And that's what happened to some extent over the last 20 something years. Um, and the same is true everywhere. When you allow the Chinese a little bit of freedom, boom, they explode with economic growth. When you allow Thailand a little bit of freedom, they create economic growth. When you reject it, they shrink. So it's all connected to how much. Imagine how rich you would be here in Japan if you really were free economically if the government really stepped back and allowed you to produce and allowed you to create a creative destruction, if that were allowed in Japan, wow, wow, you would be so rich. It's hard for us to imagine how rich. We're so rich today in spite of the mixed economy, not because of it. When you talk about morality and setting a, a sense of values, um, does each individual set his own standard of morality? Because one person's morality affects those around him, does it not? No. It does not? Uh, oh, it affects it all, right. No, but uh, to say that each person sets his own standard would simply mean subjectivity. <coughs> no, what sets the standards is the science of ethics. That is a branch of philosophy. Its particular task is to define moral standards. Then it is up to each individual to decide what he agrees with, which standards he considers right, if he thinks, which standards he considers rational. Now, an individual may discover a new set of standards, but it is not subjective, it is not just up to him. If he discovers such a subjective code, this is not really morality, it's not ethics, it's just what we call whim worship. I'm